and Blade Runner. Okay, everyone, I'm about to start our Blade Runner. Presentation today. Okay, so second time lucky. Back to Blade Runner. The exam board have said that for the Vertigo and Blade Runner question, context is going to be highlighted. That means that we need to know more about the institutional background and the studios surrounding these films than we do for our other texts, okay? The, it is likely that you're going to have a question relating to institutional context for this one. So institutional context is old Hollywood and new Hollywood. That's, the, that's kind of the name of this unit as well. So for Vertigo, we went back and we looked at old Hollywood. Okay, old Hollywood. So Vertigo is our old Hollywood example. Blade Runner is our new Hollywood example. So what's interesting about both of these texts, and it's a point that I want you to make in your essays, so let's just make it clear from the beginning. Vertigo was made at the end of the old Hollywood era, okay, as the studios were losing their grip on power. Okay, so it was, it was an example of the end of that era. And similarly, Blade Runner is made at the end of this new Hollywood era. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to what the new Hollywood era is all about now, but we must remember that Blade Runner is some, somewhat in that ballpark, but it's kind of like it's, it's leading on to other things. It's the end of the era, so there's other influences happening on that film, okay? A bit like with Spies, when we looked at that film, that's the end of the German Expressionist era. So we can see the influences of other things like new objectivism coming in on it. So it's a similar idea to that. Okay. So, New Hollywood. This era was kind of like the mid-60s into the 80s. So um, the uh, mid 60s, this is when the studios were going on the low, but other ideas were on the up, okay? So as big studio films went down, smaller, more indie in productions on the way up. And that's kind of the vibe that we get from New Hollywood. They're much more indie style. They're still made by the studios, the films that we're looking at, but they're embracing a different kind of look, okay? This was a time when a new generation of filmmakers started to make films in Hollywood, okay? So the old school were out, and this was about new people and new ideas. Also, if you look at this picture down here, you can see this type of camera that they've got here. This is a new type of um, camera, much smaller, much, much lighter than the big Hollywood studio cameras that would have been about similar size and weight to me. And you don't want to lug something the similar size and weight to me out onto the streets to film stuff on the fly. You can't do it. You need something small and portable so that you can whip around places with it. And that's what you had in the 1960s. So this new technology, new types of camera, meant new types of camera movement, much lighter, much more fluid camera movements happen. That's what we're going to see. We're going to see a difference in film stock as well, okay? So that the, it's not going to be as rich and vibrant in terms of colour as the studio system. Okay? It's not a vista vision. It's not technicolour in the same sense. The film stock, the actual film reel, was um, a bit cheaper, and therefore the films had that slightly more sort of like rough around the edges, cheaper look to them. Okay. Here's the thing, in New Hollywood, the film director, rather than the studio, is considered the author of the film. Now, I know you might be getting a bit confused now. You might be thinking, right, but Hitchcock was the author of the film. That film was so Hitchcock. Yes, Hitchcock is actually one of the exceptions to the rule in the studio system, okay? He was working in the studio system, but Hitchcock was a rebel. Hitchcock was famous. So Hitchcock could push the boundaries of what was 
allowed in that era. So he was the exception to the rule. Generally speaking, the studios were in that assembly line production of films. Shirley Temple, if you remember, we talked about how she made 12 films in one year when she was six years old. The films went off the assembly line, push, 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 like that. So, but now we have a much, we have a very different energy in Hollywood. It's all about these young, hip directors who have a vision. Okay, so films were allowed to be a bit more artistic. Okay, it wasn't the studio saying, make a Western, make a musical, here's your paycheck. It was a director saying, I've got this idea for a film, it's going to be cool. And then they would get money. Okay, so the, the, the agency has changed. More creativity is given the, to the director. Okay, more creativity to the director. Okay. which meant that we have a we have films that are a bit more surreal films that are more in tune with um what the country wanted and what the country needed we have more surreal narratives um what hollywood started to do back in the old hollywood days is that they were still churning out films that just weren't relevant to the audiences they weren't really interested in anymore Okay, the studio heads were still these old white guys who wanted to make films the same way. But, you know, young teenage audiences with a bit of money in their pocket, disposable income, didn't want to spend their money on going to the cinema. They had other things to do. Television was in nearly every home at this point towards the late 50s, early 60s. Okay, so you didn't have to go to the cinema to see your film. You could sit at home and watch some TV shows instead. But, so it was a, um, a difference in people's sort of like viewing habits. Okay, people had more money and they had more options. Okay. Um, following the Paramount Decree in 48, studios were forced to break up their businesses anyway. And most of them sold off their cinema sort of chains, their cinema part of their business. And that meant that now there is a bit more friction between the cinemas and the studios because they were both in business and there was a bit more to and fro in terms of pricing and things like that. Okay. Oh, here we go. Um, how did Hollywood deal with the change? So they, um, they went for, so when the cinema like admissions were starting to decline. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to bring people into the cinema, okay? They wanted to make films a spectacle, the big screen spectacle. You've got to go to the cinema to watch these. You need a big screen experience. So they had films that had super wide screen. They had, um, they invested in technology that meant that we, they could have technicolor films. Um, and also there was this 3D phase, a phase of having um, films in 3D. Really, really similar to what happened in the last recession when cinema admissions dipped again. It was all about pushing the spectacle. You've got to go and see um, Gravity, but you need to go and see it in the cinema in 3D. Yep, so they're pushing this technology, they're pushing this idea that you have to go to the cinema to watch this film. It's a cinema experience. It's not a small screen experience. We still get that today when there's so much, there's even more competition now from Netflix and things like that. We only go to the cinema now for that must-see film, for that, for that cinematic spectacular. So it's the same idea again. But in... Back in these days, back in sort of like the, the, the mid-50s, early 60s, they're investing in Technicolor and widescreen technology and 3D, but they were still focused on quite old-fashioned narratives. Um, historical epics and musicals were still, they thought, were quite popular. Maybe they were still popular among older people, but not really among younger people. And most specifically, this is one of our key texts, Cleopatra, 1963. We can watch it now and we can 
appreciate this spectacle. It's absolutely beautiful, glorious film. That image there, that is Elizabeth Taylor. What a bombshell. One of the most famous actresses in Hollywood at the time. And it, at the time, it was the most expensive film ever made. The sets were incredible. They physically built, you know, um, these sort of like Egyptian pyramids sets. It was absolutely enormous production and cost so much money. Um, but people didn't really go and see it. And it lost a lot of money. It was, the, it was a very famous flop. Can you write that down, Cleopatra, 1963, Elizabeth Taylor? Huge disaster. Massive, massive flop. The, the uh, studio put a lot of money into it and didn't get their return. Okay, so the audiences, the young people at the time, this is the baby boomer generation. Those boomers, they weren't interested in watching films that their parents would be interested in, like Cleopatra. They wanted something different, something that was more about them and their experience. So um, Cleopatra did not make money. And this made the studios a little bit more wary about investing such huge amounts of money in like big, spectacular, like religious, biblical epics, you know, or historical epics like Cleopatra. I might show you the trailer in a bit. Okay. So there was a massive decline in the cinematic audience. From the 1940s to the 1960s, attendance dropped by over a billion, okay? There was a, that was a massive decline. And it's because people's lifestyles, as I said before, they've changed. In the 40s, you maybe had a radio, but you'd be going to the cinema two times a week, maybe more, depending on what kind of fan you were of cinema. It was a regular thing that you do in the evenings. Think about it. You've got nothing else to do. You've got no telly. You could sit at home with your parents and listen to the radio, or you could go out to the movies. So it was a regular thing in everybody's week. You'd go a few times. But that started as, you know, as people became freer and had more money, it, became, it wasn't a necessity anymore. It wasn't an entertainment necessity, so it kind of dipped. Um, studios began to release fewer films, that assembly line productions, Shirley Temple style, didn't really guarantee a profit. So there wasn't as much of a demand for films. Um, by 1974, so this is like, I'm jumping a little bit. So by, by the 1970s, um, there was huge unemployment in Hollywood. Massive, massive unemployment. Okay, because the studios weren't making films in the way that they used to, you know, a decade earlier. Um, the output wasn't there. So if there's a decline in the amount of people going to the cinema, there's going to be a decline in the amount of output that the studios make, which means the jobs just aren't there. And what happened was, the studio started to break up. Whereas beforehand, if you were, say, a set designer, you worked for Warner Brothers, you were contracted to a particular studio. That idea all kind of like broke up and broke to pieces. And now people were freelancers. Okay, That's the way that Hollywood works today. If you're a set designer, you could be working for, you know, Warner Brothers one week, um, and then you could be working on a universal film, then, you know, in six months' time. You are in control. You pitch, you choose, you go for different jobs. Very different to the studio system where you worked for Warner Brothers, you were told, write another Western. Do, you know, you were, you were told what to do. That wasn't the case anymore. That meant massive, massive unemployment. Another thing that was significant in this era, the Hayes Code, it's such a good thing to talk about in your essays because it is a clear piece of context. We can see that in Vertigo, Hitchcock was trying to fight these restrictions. If you remember, no law, criminal or human shall be violated type idea. Um, this idea of protecting the morals of the audience, all of that stuff, not relevant anymore. And the production code, aka the Hayes Code, just kind of fizzled away. It was just kind of started to be ignored by um, by directors. So by the time 
um, that uh, 1968 rolled around, it was replaced by the Motion Picture Association of America's rating system. Okay, if you could just excuse me for one moment, I'm going to be back. If you'd just like to have a quick look at those restrictions, I'm just going to ask the students next door to turn the volume down a little bit. because It's a bit distracting. How awkward, because I'm recording right now. Um, so give me one minute. If you could have a little look at this slide, you're probably going to recognise some of those um, restrictions on there. I'll be right back. Hello, sorry, here we go, let's continue. All right, so, <clears throat> um, so as you can see, the Hayes Code, the production code, 1968, it was officially scrapped in favour of this. This is the one that we recognise, right? PG, PG-13, rated R, these are the American um, restrictions. And it gave a bit more power back to the audience, okay? It gave... Um, the audience, the choice. Okay, so if I, you know, if I as an adult wanted to go and watch a rate something rated R, then, you know, produce your ID and off you go. And it meant that directors could put in more, um, more risque content. Hitchcock loved it. More risky content you could put in there. Um, you know, more adult content. Okay, here we go. Now we're going to talk about 1967. This is the birth of this new Hollywood era, okay? This is a year where films really started to push the boundaries and where films um, started to talk about taboo issues, issues that interested young people. Um, I'm going to show you a few clips now, and what we're going to see is a thread of anti-heroes who are um, anti-authoritarian and counter-cultural. We're talking about the late 60s, okay? We're talking about an era of sex and drugs and rock and roll, and film needed to show that artistic, like, bent as well. So it needed to talk about these issues that were happening in society, okay? So as, she, as the studio control was lessening, director control was strengthening, young directors wanted to talk about things that mattered to them. So I'm going to show you a couple of um, things, and our heroes are anti-authoritarian, counter-cultural. We're going to start with my personal, one of my great favourite films. It's called In the Heat of the Night, starring Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier is a, um, a black detective um, from sort of like the northern states. I can't remember what state he's from. And he is uh, he's sent to investigate a crime in one of the southern states. So this is a story about um, an authority figure. This is 1967, an authority figure who is a black man trying to solve a crime in um, what we would term like a redneck state. Okay, I'm going to attempt to show this to you. Local businesses have been there for us this year. It's time we return the law. Just leave a Google review. Of course, sorry. I'm going to attempt to show this to you through the screen. Okay, one second. Bear with me. In the heat of the night. Um, I should warn you that there is language in this uh, scene. It's a very famous scene, but there is language in this scene that um, is outdated. Because Google reviews help local businesses stay strong. Support local businesses you love with a little help from Google. Gee, he thinks entirely sinister. Well, I'll be damned. Could I talk to 
to you about it in private. Well, you can't talk to me about it in privacy because I got Cobus wallet right here in my hand. We took it from Harvey Oberst. You don't think he gave it to him, do you? I don't know, but Oberst could have come along after the crime, found it, picked it up. I don't know. That's what the boy said he did. Well, I'm sorry, man, but I said different. Well, when I examined the deceased, it was obvious that the fatal blow was struck from an angle of 17 degrees from the right, which makes it almost certain the person who did it is right hand. So what? Old Harvey's left hand, Chief. Everybody in town knows that. Yeah, uh, that, that's what we figured out, Chief. Uh, Harvey's lefty, uh huh. Well, you're pretty sure of yourself, ain't you, Virgil? Uh, Virgil, that's a funny name for a nigger boy that comes from Philadelphia. What do they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. Mr. Tibbs? Well, Mr. Wood, take Mr. Tibbs, take him down to the depot, and I mean boy like now. Have the FBI lab send you the report on this. Not that it'll make any difference. I'll take that. Oh, you won't. I'm sending it in personally. What a great day to record a session. I'm muted and everything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, that is a really, really famous scene. They call me Mr. Tips. And it is a reflection of the battles that were going on in society at the time. Young directors wanted to talk about these types of issues. They wanted to show people the divisions in society and create a debate and talk about it. The other films I've put on there are Cool Hand Luke, which is a, a film about a, a young guy who goes to prison. And again, he's like up against authority figures, you know, all the time. So he's battling against authority figures. Um, so these are films about usually young people fighting the system. So this was uh, sort of like a countercultural anti-heroes fighting against the establishment. Um, and that's what lots of the films started to talk about, especially films from these new Hollywood directors. So there's one example for you. They call me Mr. Tibbs. Um, Sidney Poitier is such an amazing actor. He is actually, he was actually the first black um, actor to win Best Actor uh, Oscar. Uh, let me take us back to the PowerPoint. Here we go. OK, so 1967, a real turning point for Hollywood. Those three films there, In the Heat of the Night, Dirty Dozen and Cool Hand Luke, as like an aside one, so you can watch those trailers in your own time. Um, they started to look and feel different to the, the Hollywood content that people were used to. So here we go. Who were these new groovy directors? Believe it or not, I'm talking about these guys. Yes, they are in that picture. They do look very old and very white, but that is a, a newish picture. Um, we've got Spielberg, Scorsese, De Palma, George Lucas, and Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola. Sorry, drew a blank there. So all those 
famous directors who now we think of them, they are now these guys are the old guard. Now these guys are the classic directors, right? But back in the day, back in the mid 70s, they were making waves. They were the young and cool directors. I mean, yes, looking at that picture, we can see that they are still the patriarchy. They are still examples of like white male ideals, but their approach to filmmaking embraced a lot more liberal ideas and challenged authority for the time, for the time. Even though now um, we look at them and we think they look pretty old. I mean, that picture must be from the 90s, just looking at Martin Scorsese's hair. It's got to be a 90s pic. Um, this could also, to me, I, every time I look at that, I just think it looks like it could be a still from that film, The Irishman, that Scorsese made for Netflix last year. It would just be that. And that film was criticised for being a film that had a lot of just like old men talking in it. Okay. okay. So, um, 1970s, the big three directors that were making massive, massive breakthroughs, Francis Ford Coppola. We are going to watch a little bit of a film, a trailer for a film called Apocalypse Now. It came out in 1979. Um, these films just feel so different from the films of that studio era, okay? The, the way it's shot, the themes, what people are talking about are really, really different. And what we can see is the influence of French New Wave and a lot of European New Waves. So European New Waves sort of happened in the late 50s, early 60s. We're going to study French New Wave for our next topic. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to look at Jean-Luc Godard as an, as an, as an auteur. So um, these young cool directors liked the French New Wave films or Italian neorealism, if you're Martin Scorsese. They liked what was going on in Europe in the late 50s. And that was really avant-garde, really weird, really um, portable, fast filmmaking style. So they really admired that. But they also had a lot of respect for the fi filmmakers of the Hollywood era, the old school Hollywood era, the golden age. So these young cool directors liked Hitchcock. They liked John Ford. Okay, they liked Kurosawa. They were they were students of film. They took their influences from a little bit from Europe, a little bit from Japan, and quite a bit from like Hitchcock and the studio system as well. So these new Hollywood directors embraced a lot of cinematic ideas. And I just want to show you a bit of apocalypse now. Little bathroom this is the end, beautiful friend. I've been a soldier since I was 19, and I still haven't learned how to wait for it. I wanted a mission for my sins, they gave me one. Nobody'd ever gone on a mission like it before. And when it was over, I'd never want another one. Your mission is to proceed up the Nung River in a Navy patrol boat. Pick up Colonel Kurtz's path at New Mung Ba. When you find the colonel, infiltrate his team by whatever means available and terminate the colonel's command. Terminate. Terminate is extreme prejudice. My orders say I'm not supposed to know where I'm taking this boat, so I don't. But one look at you and I know it's going to be hot. Right where you want it. This is the first of the night air calves, son. We're coming for the rising sun. 
and about a mile out, we'll put on the music. It scares the hell out of the slopes. My boys love it. Come in the morning. Smells like victory. Man, this is better than Disneyland. Short and we gotta go up there so you can kill one of our own guys. You a man, I said I think you mad! They're all dead, stupid. Who's the commanding officer here? I hear you. Ain't you? He was close. He was real close. I couldn't see him, but I could feel him. These are all his children, man, as far as you can see. They think you've come to uh, to take him away, and I hope that isn't true. Could we, uh, talk to Colonel Kurtz? No, you don't talk to the Colonel, uh, well, well, you listen to him. Are you an assassin? I'm a soldier. You're an errand boy. Sent by grocery clerks. So that was Apocalypse. It's time to show local business. Several things to pull out of that clip. This is an anti-war film. And everyone watching that trailer, it kind of like it feels as if it's like an energizing film, celebrating war, but it really isn't. It really isn't. It's an anti-war film. It's anti the Vietnam War. Um, and you wouldn't have got that. Back in the 1940s, when uh, the studios were making films about war, they were really patriot patriotic, you know, celebrating um, the American soldier. Whereas now, this is in the 70s, we have films that are actually showing us the realities of war, the destructiveness of war, anti-war films. Um, and it's... Uh, yeah, it's really interesting that we've got an actor such as Marlon Brando, who was an actor from that golden era. Back in the golden era, he was kind of like a, a young, hot actor. And now he's an older man in this film. But an actor of that style in this film, really, really interesting. I recommend Apocalypse Now to you. It's a really good one. Film students, you've got to watch it. We've got to watch Apocalypse now. And I've put an extra little link at the bottom of this um, PowerPoint here as well, a little um, documentary about Apocalypse now at the bottom. Okay, if you want more information, I think some of you will. Okay. Um, so new directors had much more creative control and they were given quite a bit of money sometimes by these studios, okay? So these big studios, Warner Brothers and Columbia, um, had you know employed a lot of these hot young directors to make films. Um, Bonnie and Clyde um, is one of the most celebrated films of the New Hollywood era. There's a link there at the bottom of the slide. I'm going to let you guys watch that in your own time because I think I've shown you a couple of clips today, so I'll leave it there. But Bonnie and Clyde is one a film that was really celebrated as one of the first films of this new Hollywood era. Um, again, it's got themes of sex. It's about a young couple going on a killing spree. They're anti-heroes, anti-establishment. Really, really interesting. Okay. So, um, 
let's recap some of these things. So we have MGM, Paramount, Universal started to rent their equipment out to young directors. They were no longer the studios that would employ thousands of people on locate on their studio lots all the time. They actually rented out. They actually became a facilitator. Okay, so you'd be like, right, you can rent our studio space. You can rent our equipment to make your film. So it was more about the creativity of the director. During the 80s, large multinational businesses started to buy up studios. Okay, so as they came into financial difficulty, businesses, conglomerates started to buy the studios and they became part of a larger business empire. Um, things like the seven year contract no longer existed. Okay, so actors had agents to negotiate fees rather than having a fixed seven year contract where the studio is in charge of your image. That's not the case anymore. The actor has more control over their own fate. Okay, other big things that were happening in the 70s cable TV. Okay, Time Incorporated Home Box Office, aka cable TV came into your home and Sony Betamax VCRs, the video player, watching films in your home. Now, think about it. Before those inventions, if you wanted to watch something like um, Cleopatra, you had to watch it in the cinema in that window before it goes and you wouldn't be able to see it again. You couldn't just watch it whenever you wanted. But once you've got that video player in your house, you can, and you buy that video or you rent that video, you have the power to watch whatever you want, whenever you want. You didn't, you know, the studios and the cinemas didn't control what you watched and when anymore, you did. So that meant even more competition for the cinemas, okay? The cinemas then, you know, um, there's another dip when home video came in. Um, meaning that people were going to the cinemas as much, but it was a good revenue stream for the studios because the studios still owned those films. So every time you bought one, every time you rented one, a bit of money went to the studio. So picked up a little bit for the studios, but for the cinemas, it went down a little bit more. Okay. New Hollywood, not everything was rosy all the time. Okay, so studios were still taking risks with these young, untested directors. Apocalypse Now is a big success. They gave a lot of money to a young director. It could have been a disaster. The production was a hot mess, okay? They had um, stars that were really temperamental and difficult. The shooting was really difficult. Um, it's a really interesting case study. Have a look at it. Um, it was a really hard production process. Um, but it was a film called Heaven's Gate, 1980. This is our second flop. So we've got Cleopatra. It's our 1960s flop. And then we have the Heaven's Gate, made in 1980. This was another massive flop. So what they did is they gave a buttload of money to a young, cool director called My Michael Simino um, to make his you know, artistic vision. And it was a hot mess. It's a, it's a bonkers, dreadful film. No one went to see it. And it nearly bankrupted MGM and United Artists. Okay, so at this point, 1980, studio started to get a little bit wary of giving a lot of money to these young directors, these young up and coming directors. Um, Heaven's Gate taught them that these films could fail. And it was a huge, huge disaster for the studio. So that meant, this is where it impacts on Blade Runner people. That meant that, Studios were a little bit wary. Studios wanted to take more control. They're going to hire the young cool director, but then they're going to have a studio executive trying to control that person. So we get, you've probably heard about this, where studio executives and directors start to sort of like disagree. This is why the studios is their money, is their investment. It might be the director's creative vision, but it's the studio's money. That's where we start to get this conflict. So, and it did affect Blade Runner. It affected Blade Runner big, big time. Um, other things that were happening in the 1970s. Um, Jaws, 1975, and Star Wars, 1977. Okay, the family-friendly blockbuster. These were huge, huge movies. And 
taught Hollywood that big family friendly blockbusters could make yourself a lot of money. They became an event. You've got to go to, you've not seen Star Wars? You've got to go to the cinema to watch Star Wars, man. What are you doing? You've got to go to the cinema to watch Jaws. So these big event movies or blockbusters became very, very lucrative. Um, and this led to something. So in the mid 70s, can you write this down? This is the start of the blockbuster age of Hollywood. Crossover here. So we've got new Hollywood and the blockbuster age sort of like coexisting, but the blockbuster's making more money. So that's what's going to get more investment. Smaller indie films, sort of like Woody Allen style indie films, going to find it hard to get investment. So the new Hollywood look and aesthetic, less popular, the blockbuster starts to take off. So it's a transitional era, the one that we're talking about. So as well as this blockbuster film, so you've got Jaws, there's Star Wars, had to put Indiana Jones in the mix, and one of my favourites, Flash Gordon. So we've got these family-friendly blockbusters. The reason why they make so much money is because you take the kids and that's extra tickets to the cinema, okay? So that's more money for the studio. Yum, 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 they loved it. But on the flip side of that, we've also got another rise in the popularity of a particular genre called hard-body action. This is the Schwarzenegger. This is the Stallone film, the Chuck Norris film, okay? They're big guys with big guns. These guns and those guns. So these hyper-masculine, hard-body films are a reaction to the second wave of feminism where women were asking for equal pay. How dare they? Um, so this is a hyper-masculine reaction to the Vietnam War and the second wave of feminism. So we've got, you know, the reaction here, as you can see that picture of Stallone there with his machine gun uh, in Rambo. Um, so we've got this reaction to that, and they became quite popular, these hard body films. This is also the rise of, like, B-movie horrors, like Halloween became really popular as well. So in the... So, this is the this is when the film started to pick up late 70s early 80s and people started to become more interesting all right oh that was a lot of talking wasn't it are you guys still with me <laughs> are you still here give me a little yes in the chat are you still here with me good okay that was lots and lots of information all at once. That's what a lecture's about. So that was good practice for you for university, like taking notes as someone's talking. And what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about some of these ideas and do an exercise where we get to use these ideas, do something a bit creative with them. So that's the end of the lecture. It's 10 past 10. You're, you have a 15 minute break. Okay. Come back to the meet in 15 minutes. Break time, and we're going to talk about this stuff. Okay, bye. Everyone's going.